and I think, and I forget which page that's on, I don't have that noted right here. Um, but you would see on there that usually in October we ask the local boards to give us direction. This is starting my seventh year. All but once of all six boards, can I remember when there wasn't a direction to start with a level service budget across. So is there something different that you have for a suggestion in preparing these budgets? We're doing it the way we have done it in previous years, uh, knowing you know, there, there's the issue that we're talking about tonight about what may happen with governance. We're starting, we would start from, you know, looking at each building anyway, so, and asking what is needed. So we will work that way. Uh, the thing I need to say for my colleagues, to my right, Lori, she works extremely hard and does a lot of work on these budgets. She's the main person that prepares those and supporting the principals. Looking at our work down the road, if there's something you think you need, please tell us at the beginning, not at the end or partway through the process. We can't do a lot of budget pieces this year. We just don't have the personnel time to do five, six, seven versions of budget. So if you think it's something that's needed, we're more than willing to do it, but it can't be a model this, model that, model this. Um, so I'm just asking for some, for some understanding from the board members. It's not that we don't want to do the work for you, we do. It's just the capacity and you know, what we're looking at. There's a lot of business functions that have to be taken care of if we're looking going into a merger. We don't know that until after what the state board does. But I just wanted to explain all that with timeline. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them about the timeline. Uh, but we're working. Are there any questions for Bill and Lori about the budget timeline? Do you want to speak a little more to priorities and constraints? Well, yeah, I kind of alluded to that right now. Um, the central office right now, we have many, many hours of overtime happening right now um, between servicing uh, the budgets here and the change in health care, both by Blue Cross and by uh, data path. Uh, we've incurred a lot of expenses on that. Not only monetary and personnel time, but personnel stress. Uh, again, we're willing to do what you need, but we're pretty strapped right now for doing a lot of different requests. And sometimes they're pretty innocent. Um, Matt and I, he used himself at the executive board, so I'm gonna go there. He asked a what if question and thought it would be a few minute analysis. And when I told him it was about 15 hours worth of work between the principal and myself and Lori, I said, we can go do that. But I'd like to try to calm those, I'd like to talk those out with you about the type of time that takes. It was a question of what, what if, with the capital plan, if we wanted to spend the whole thing, which meant I had to go get an architect, to start doing some price estimates and all that to come back and say, you know, it's just, it puts a lot of work when it's, it's a really good question. It's a fair question to be asking. And it's one the board should be asking. It's just the capacity to do all of that. We'll just hire a project manager. Yeah, and I'll just kind of restate that in slightly other words. Um, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary year. Um, you know, all the work that the, the work. Uh, central office yeah. and the leadership team have to do in a typical year, plus the chaotic energy of uh, what's happening six um, and other things besides. Um, so the executive committee talked a little bit about you know the need to really try to minimize um, random or special requests uh, to Bill and the leadership team at this time if, if, if possible. So really give some thought and discuss like do we really need this right now? Is this really a priority because there's just a ton of stuff uh, going on. Um, negotiations too with the negotiation here um, and the executive committee members all agreed mm, uh, that we would serve as the police on our respective boards to try to reinforce that point and make sure that we're hearing that from the board. Any questions or comments about that? Thank you. Uh, and that was basically 3.2, if 
was uh, what I just said. Uh, the community go to 3.3 and, and Matthew, I think, yeah. can I just uh, yeah, point? Yeah. Uh, you would ask Laura to be a timekeeper, and, and I'm going to go to time. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to give her the time or you want to see how we get we get down there. I'm about to give her the time for this. Okay. okay. So uh, 3.3 is the school start time report, and we all have uh, five minutes to this. I hope that folks have had a chance to read the report from the school start time committee. Uh, is Oh, you are. Okay. Karen Bradley can't be here, unfortunately. But um, you have the school start time report on page 27, I believe. Um, the bottom line is no further action for this school year. Um, there's enough chaotic energy as it is uh, going on. At the same time, we're convinced that sleep is still uh, a big problem for our students, especially at U32. Um, even though of the, maybe the big three physical well-being questions, um, hunger, we have a good food services program to cover that. Keeping students warm, dry, and safe, see for yourselves. Um, but sleep, which is what we're specifically hoping the students do not do in school is um, nevertheless something they do outside of school that has a huge impact on their performance in school. Uh, and it's a problem in high school that only gets worse when the students get into college. It's, um, there's, uh, it's just deeply rooted in, in culture and the use of technology and the scheduling of of children's days and everything else. So what we are really looking at is pursuing this on a very back burner basis um, with just in an educational mode. Um, I think Allison had a good term for this. Gentle education um, is what I recall her saying. Uh, we're just not going to um, we're just not going to heave this one onto uh, an already straining system um, while keeping it alive, the awareness of the problem. Is there a, I, I, so there was a couple of suggestions that uh, education activities be done. Um, is there a mechanism that, that uh, I read the report, I don't know, think, think of the SD board has to take we don't, uh, I mean, here I am kind of speaking a little bit from the hip, um, but I, I don't recall us foreseeing any action for the supervisory union board. I think what will probably happen is that on the U32 board, we might, this might be a recurring topic of discussion, and at other boards as, as they see fit. In that case, the uh, charge and timeline for the school start time committee uh, runs out this month. So uh, there really is no action required for us, um, in essence, to table this issue as recommended by the, the committee. Um, so are there any other comments or discussion on that? Hearing none, we'll move to 3.4 is our policy committee charge that's on page 28 of the packet if you want to look at it. And uh, Lindy, I don't know if you wanted to, to speak to this briefly. As a policy committee. Floor with five minutes. At our last meeting, we realized in the past we haven't had a committee chair. We just met and talked and determined that we needed to do that. And I got the honor being the committee chair, and we put together a policy committee charge. We've been working together to update policies using the Vermont School Board Association's model policies so that we're a little more in line across the schools with policies that are required, recommended, and to be considered. 
and we've gone through the required ones. We're working on the recommended ones at this point. And then according to our charge, the last thing would be to look at all the policies that are left at our local school districts to see if they're still relevant or were they superseded by these recommended and required ones through the BSBA. So our charge, we have an order that's going down the line of that as a committee. And there's a representative from each board on that committee. And then did you want me to go through the policies that we were bringing forward or? That's up to you. you. Or you can speak to them when we, when we uh, have the action and also. Okay, so probably then. Uh, so we asked the policy committee to uh, suggest a charge uh, for the committee. This is what they came back with. I would have to take discussion or a motion about that charge. I just had a question about the part of the charge that has to do with identifying individual policies held at local schools and rescinding them at the SU board level. If you could just talk a little bit more about what that actually would mean and look like. Sorry. <laughs> um, that was put in there because there are binders at the local schools with things that haven't been dealt with since the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and possibly, or most likely, are out of date, or they've been superseded by the recommended and the required ones that we've been working on. And so to go through all these local binders and make sure that there isn't a policy from 20 years ago that would cause confusion down the line if we adopted one and not rescinded an old one. Yes, Alex. I'm Alan Gilbert, if you don't know. I don't have a name for it. I'm on the school board. I had a question about whether you have any review statute is to empower the SU to actually adopt policies and then rescind policies of local boards. Because my understanding of the way the statutes work is that there is an expressive, express power given to local boards to develop policies, but there is none in statute given to the supervisory union board to develop policies. It's very confusing. I mean, I think Bill and I were talking about it before. It's, it's never been straightened out, and I'm just wondering if that came up in any of your conversations. It did not. Um, what we were discussing was reviewing all of these in order to bring it to the light of the local boards because there's so many old ones on there that may have been redone. And then whenever we bring policies, they come to this board, but if they were local ones, they go to the local board. So maybe that's the answer to the question that Johnny was asking. If I, I think I understood what she was asking. She was basically saying it's still the local boards that are going to have to take the final, the final move to rescind the policy in order for them to adopt one. That would be my understanding at this point. So I, I guess I would suggest uh, on that basis a, a small amendment to the charge language. It would be to um, strike the last five words, which is to the supervisory union board, and, and just put as needed there instead leading up to the policy committee and to the entity in question, um, you know, how to dispense with that recommendation. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure we're still on the same page because I do agree that at the policy committee that we said any that needed to be rescinded needed to be done at the local schools, but how they can be passed out is at this from my understanding, the superintendent can work that way. It can, you, the locals would, if, if, if I, if Worcester, I'm just going to give you Alan, if the Worcester Board adopted a policy 20 years ago, they most likely should be the one to rescind it. If the SG wants to adopt a policy for all the boards, 
I'm pretty sure they can. I haven't gotten that illegal review of it, which is what Alan was asking. And I think that suggesting that the change that I uh, recommended addresses the um, inconsistency in the charge language, I think the policy committee is free to operate that way. You know, if you want to bring it to the SU board so that it's on everyone's radar, um, that's fine. But I, you know, which entity needs to rescind which policy ultimately is going to be um, a question for each entity. Yeah, so yes, Rick. I mean, isn't this article, isn't this almost moot? I mean, with consolidation? Essentially, the, you know, your local entities basically cease to exist. I mean, this becomes, that's kind of the way the whole direction of governance is going, which bothers me immensely. I mean, this is, my opinion, this is community, this community business. I believe in, in continuity across the union, but I mean, after July 1st, assuming that we have consolidation formed upon us, I mean, this all basically becomes a duty of that consolidated board. Correct? I believe so. I mean, it's a question that comes up with a lot of things. Um, but, you know, this is something we started to address back in the spring and we wanted to put in place, and so here we are. So, you know, yeah. We don't know what's going to happen either. So. <coughs> yes, Stephen. Uh, Matthew, short of a, an actual vote in trying to amend this on the floor um, would the policy committee be amenable to having heard the discussion that the first the two sentences the first sentence is fine and made sense and just ask them to consider the discussion and some of the uncertainty expressed tonight and just reword that last sentence and then bring it forward after their next meeting. Sure, it's a fine way to proceed. Yeah. Okay with me. Yeah. If that is going to be your course of action, I wonder, I think I read this in the minutes that you were talking about the role of the policy committee in helping the local entities adopt policies that are consistent with each other, if not identical. And I just wondered if you, if there was a reason that that wasn't included in the charge. It seemed like an important part of the purpose of the policy committee. And so I wondered if, if, you, if you're going back to amend this, if you might want to include that in the charge so it's clear that that's uh, part of why the policy committee exists. Sure. That we sense? could add that. I thought the where it says provided by the VSBA shows that continuity because we're using their language but we could make it clear. Okay, well with those, yeah, we're, we're over time. So with those suggestions, um, we'll table this issue until our next meeting and, and uh, look forward to the policy committee's um, you know, recommendation at that time. Okay, so we're gonna move on to 3.5, which is WCSU Board Retreat Review and Next uh, Steps. And we've got um, 15, 15 minutes for this one. Um, so we'll start with a review of the retreat and feedback. I think um, most of the district boards have already had discussions uh, flowing out of the retreat about uh, what we heard, what our opinions are, what um, some actions we might consider as a result various different kinds of things. I, I participated in some of those discussions. They were very active ones uh, for the most part, but um, we want to provide time for the uh, SU board to uh, weigh in. This is the first time that we've met since that retreat. Um, so if anyone has observations or comments or thoughts uh, on the retreat itself, was it valuable at an event? Um, and then also, you know, uh, regarding the content, Five minutes 
So being a former chair who frequently chastised board members for lack of participation, I would like to commend the school board members for um, a lot of participation. Um, and I, was, I was very impressed. And I, I just wanted to share that. The only other brief comment I'll make, I know there has, my understanding is there's been a fair amount of discussion around guarantees. And I would, I would um, encourage boards to think very carefully if they're going to guarantee what it is they are going to guarantee. Uh, it's about guaranteeing um, what outcomes for students. Um, that's the specific thing we're talking about. The boards might make specific guarantees on what's going to happen with students. Other thoughts or observations coming on the retreat? I thought, I thought the, uh, the keynote speaker was excellent, you know, and spoke to just better utilizing resources and, you know, looking at the way we operate, when we could actually really improve. I mean, I, it was very eye-opening for me. As, and it, it was interesting seeing they come from very large school systems, but which aren't uh, comparable in many ways, but you could also see that there were a lot of things that could really be adapted to our system, I think, quite effectively. I think it was a well-spent day. From my observation, uh, I know amongst uh, some really positive conversations that took place at our board and as I understood took place at other boards, uh, from the takeaways from this uh, retreat, what uh, Kind of, uh, I don't know the right word, puzzle's not the right word, but uh, as I hear about the plan for budgeting for this upcoming year, we're all talking about level service budgets. Uh, and I guess, is that, uh, are we uh, currently meeting uh, sort of the objectives of what we took away from that retreat uh, as individual boards? Uh, and, if, and so perhaps as the level service but um, I don't know, I guess I feel like if, if momentum uh, was to be built out of that, we might see some, some movement in how we do our budgets. Uh, and I, I understand the landscape of, uh, of time and energy and resources right now, uh, but I guess I just wanted to at least put that out there for people to consider. Um, I'll just to comment on that briefly. Timeline, suggested timeline that we laid out for goal number two was to try to have a, a, a goal uh, around student learning outcomes uh, that we could agree on by December or so and make sure that we were budgeting accordingly um, to you know, resources and support that goal. Um, it's a little bit late actually in the budget process for that because the budgeting is already starting now. My sense of the, the meetings that I attended is that there's some appetite for advancing the discussion on this, figuring out what's possible and what's appropriate, uh, and seeing if we can get somewhere with it. That's, if I, that's as vague as I can be, I guess. Um, you know, just to summarize, I think people were really interested in the idea, it seems to me, most people were interested in the idea of, um, first of all, making commitments to improve student learning outcomes or asking that of the leadership team uh, to come back to us with recommendations and suggestions for how to do that. Um, but there's also some concern, particularly around the word guarantee, and you know, what does that mean, and um, does, that, does that put us in a tricky spot, essentially, uh, or is it um, you know, an aspiration, ideally, idealistic, aspirational goal um, that's galvanizing? Uh, you know, I think the jury's still out. If the, uh, if the board has reviewed the, the memo from the members of the school quality committee, uh, which is in the packet on page 29, uh, you know, I think 
most people know that the school quality committee, committee has been. 35 minutes are up. Okay, thanks. Um, has really been looking at this issue for several months already. Uh, really examining kind of what data we have available, what it's telling us, what we don't know and would like to know, um, what the data may be suggesting we need to do better, these kinds of things. Uh, and so this group um, you know, recommended that we might consider at our October TSL meeting uh, asking the leadership team to report back to us on um, you know, how are we aligned with some of the, the best practices or ideas that we heard about during the retreat? Uh, if not, where are we not? Um, and then some suggestions on how we might be able to um, be more aligned with those um, or make better commitments around student learning. Um, I'm, I know that this is a priority for Bill. Uh, I also know that it's a lot of work and uh, a lot of time to do that kind of thing. So. that we need to do tonight, we can talk more about it. Uh, but I think the plan, you know, the plan of people are not, uh, nobody objects is to have this on our agenda for the October carousel meeting and take up the discussion of um, you know, what we should be doing and maybe ask for the leadership team input on this too and try to come to a place where we feel good and positive and comfortable. Yeah. Um, the question of a guarantee was actually a very lively discussion at the board um, a couple of meetings ago. And what we really grappled with was, are we willing to make the statement a guarantee which carries with it um, a certainty, a commitment, uh, a advocating to putting resources behind that guarantee? Um, I suspect not every board would, would, uh, would define guarantee the same way. Um, but this may be an area where uh, certain boards have different, not aspirations, but you know, aspirations with a guarantee um, that just may differ over time. So I would just in encourage people to have a very uh, detailed conversation about that, have community members really discuss that, whether they are willing to stand behind a board saying, we guarantee this particular result uh, and are willing to commit the resources to achieve it. Um, because guarantee, you know, most folks see a guarantee as a certainty as opposed to an aspiration. And if we're using that type of language, we should really uh, mean it. Um, so it's a, a great discussion to have because it really does uh, cause us uh, as boards and the administration to really step up and pursue a specific purpose. And just so it's clear, the guarantee was for literacy, uh, a degree of literacy at third grade and degree of numerosity, Bill. Numeracy new, new, new new uh, by fourth grade. Um, so it wasn't a guarantee that was everything would be uh, beautiful, uh, but it was very specific in terms of goals that are foundational uh, building, uh, foundational uh, points in learning. I just want to clarify too. So the school quality committee didn't have a quorum at our last meeting, but Brian, Kari, and I were there. And did talk about the guarantee question. And I, from the perspective of the School Quality Committee, I think the idea of guarantees is still an idea, and those some of those ideas that were floated at the retreat are ideas that we feel like we would want to learn a lot more about before um, the three of us as individuals would want to be promoting those or encouraging boards to adopt them. Um, for example, could there be unintended negative consequences of adopting a particular guarantee because of the way that that would drive resource allocation and prioritization and push some things to the sidelines? And it's like we would really want to hear from, um, we really want to hear a lot more about what that looks like and how other districts have used guarantees in ways that have overall been positive for the learning outcomes and not had unintended negative consequences. So, all of that is still in the hypothetical range and the, um, hearing from our leadership team and identifying what we do know about how guarantees have worked and what we don't know about how they have worked I think would be a really important first step. Allison? 
along those same lines, I'd be really interested in making sure that we discuss exactly how we are going to measure literacy and numeracy. So what test the quality committee was looking at, what testing, uh, test is the right word, what measurements we have available to us so that we can evaluate more clearly what, what it is we're considering a guarantee upon. <coughs> I would say, that Bill, I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but I feel like the input of the leadership team on this is really critical. And I, I, I guess uh, I wouldn't want to ask you to like, do a report or something, but just if we're going to talk about this, I don't know where you Is that I mean, I think that the, uh, the, what we took away from, the, I guess it was just the three of us, was um, we would look to, our recommendation was to look to the leadership team to, um, we could provide some, some framework, some sort of aspirational type of goals or just more uh, 30,000 foot uh, goals, but we would look to the leadership team to, to really drive uh, what it was and how, to Allison's question, how it would be uh, measured. Did we did as an appointment discussion amongst the leadership team. Uh, yeah, we don't have it fully refined. I mean, I'm going to be uh, honest with that. We're still trying to figure out what that would look like to us and what that means. Um, and Allison's right on point with it's not one, you know, what are the measures, but it's not one measure, it's multiple measures. Uh, we, we'll be talking about this next month when we look at the student data and you want multiple points of measure. So that you know there's, I think there's there's an appetite from the leadership team to talk about the priorities in our system, um, and that's really what I think Nate was getting at. Less of the word guarantee, but more its set of priorities. You can't say everything. We say everything. This is what I took away from what he said. That's other than my own personal reading. You, you, you try to do everything. one of the biggest um, uh, standouts and takeaways from the presentation, which I will also comment was, was phenomenal. And I also want to say Lisa's um, write-up of it in the minutes is incredible. And it's worth taking a walk down through the minutes because the, you really get a, a pretty complete feel for what we all experience from the Excellent speaker, excellent presenter. Um, but she did a really good job of distilling it down. Okay, one more minute. So, um, the takeaway, one of the big takeaways was to do more with what you have. And so, talking about budgeting, it didn't have, it wasn't a way that we were going to come and say we need a whole bunch more money to do these other things. It was really an internal reflection of how we do things and reprioritizing and uh, reallocating inside of the I, I just wanted to say for the general public, because they don't really know what we're talking about, the retreat itself was about best practices of how to be ready the achievements of, uh, of our study, uh, of our uh, technically raising the achievement of our students. And the, the one thing that I want to say for, for all of us, I, I was seeing this more as an opportunity, not even as a, what were our using right now, what, what are going to be our guarantees? Our, to me, it was seeing what are our opportunities and what are other schools, you know, what are we doing as a whole and what the leadership team is telling us. So I saw a lot of opportunities that we could take and the, the word to me, guarantees, kind of scares me a little bit. So I would like to talk more about, you know, the core instruction and, and see it more as opportunities rather than I, I really appreciate the point. I'll just say because I can that the word guarantees kind of excites me. So, but that's the conversation. You know, that's why not. we're all coming from a different place. Um, so, I, the school quality committee. I know will continue. Yeah. Um, oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, I uh, was. Uh, I did not attend the, uh, the retreat, but I was able to see it on video and, and to read the minutes, and I agree with you. They were fantastic. 
I guess I would really caution against treating um, Nate Levinson's material as, or Nate Levinson as the last uh, word in, in best practices. Um, as you may or may not know, he was, uh, he spent two years at the superintendent. He does not have classroom experience, and there were certainly some ethical issues um, that he experienced. And I would, so I, I, all that said, I think he had a lot of really great points, but I would caution us to not solely rely on him, but also to tap the incredible you know, hundreds of collective that we have in our classrooms in terms of setting those priorities that we need to do. Thanks. So we're going to have the school college quality committee will continue to discuss this. Um, I guess we'll put on the agenda for our October meeting. I think they're I'm sensing that there's an appetite to discuss it and try to, again, advance the conversation. Um, and I guess I'm just asking whatever leadership team does not have bandwidth, that's fine, but if you do, then we appreciate any kind of guidance or input. Yeah, to, we, we, in our last meeting, we talked about that that's part of what our October student monitoring reports are back of, of saying. Nate wasn't presenting his work, he was presenting work of other, uh, as he said, it's really aligned with multi-tier system supports, which has been a cornerstone of educational best practice for the past 10 or 15 years. And that was really the system he was pushing. He was pushing us towards, and that's the work we've been doing. So we'll show those as we did, as the leadership team did that day, right on the spur of the moment. Awesome. Thanks. So before we move to three point six, I'm going to suggest that we try to dispense with our action item five point four, uh, which is the first reading of the policies we listed here. So are anyone going to, to move those policies of the slate? So moved. Seconded. Uh, moved. Second. So second. Door to move second. Uh, discussion of these, these policies. Yeah. Well, in light of the discussion we just had, where it says you see from the policies, um, C2 bylaws, the question becomes what is this board has the authority to rescind uh, a Rumley policy. Uh, so I would raise that as a question and would ask that we remove that or amend it to remove that out of this slate of policies until we have a clearer question, a clearer answer on that question. Could you let me know where you're looking at? This is 5.4. Yeah. Oh, shoot. I'm going to take money and that Chani to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. So for clarity, there's not anything to rescind the Romney. No. There's nothing to rescind. Right. Thank That's you. Right. Yeah, there's there's only first reading of SU policies as, as listed. <laughs> that does raise a procedural question for me is that if these are first reads, um, and I, I, I was assuming that all boards um, were at their local level then rescinding local policies that might. Um, whatever the word is with uh, with these policies, uh, is that is that the case or is it just uh, our board? It, from looking quickly looking at all the agendas which I have right in front of me, Brian, they're on all the board agendas. So my next question is that this is a first read. These policies don't go into effect at this read, but if we rescind policies at a local board tonight. Are we rescinding? Are we going to be in limbo with some of these policies where no policies, in fact, in place? So your the policy and policies, which is common across all six boards, including and the supervising you, so I should say all seven, is that on one read you may adopt policies if the board so chooses. Our practice is usually two, if and if there are any big technical changes on the second to go right to adoption. Um, we were just trying to do the piece that the uh, policy committee had been charged to do to bring these things apart, and these were pieces that came straight through. So, so I guess perhaps clarity on what is being asked of the board tonight to do, and whether we are, if this is a first read or a... So far, the motion on the table is to uh, approve the first reading of these policies. So they would not be adopted the motion were amended uh, to, to use that language. Jim, could be. Hey. 
Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to try to move quickly. I don't have any problem with any of these, but our, our common practice is to approve on second reading. And, and what I might suggest to the local board chairs is they table the action item if there's any rescinding of local board um, policies in their meeting tonight to table that until after the second reading of the issue. From what I read on them, there's nothing like that's crucial if we don't put something in place um, before the next full board. Are there any questions for the policy committee or any other comments about uh, on the motion or any other discussion? Okay, hearing none. Are you doing that? Okay. Uh, are we going? Are, is this an opportunity to ask questions on any policies that are before us? Okay. Uh, so. Um, this is C uh, 118, uh, the Notice of Non-Discrimination. Um, what, I guess what I just was curious to know, because um, I remember this came up in uh, conversations that we had at our board at one point around the building use policy, and um, issues around discrimination or equal access to the building, um, and the other discussion around, you know, what happens if a hate group, for example, wants to use the building. Uh, and here, I, as I'm reading this, uh, and this is not, law is not my area of expertise, uh, I, I understand in this first sentence that uh, we cannot discriminate uh, in, in that way. And so what I guess I'm curious is that if, if that's the case, does how does this policy interact with the potential building use policy where we might want to, where there might be a desire to have control over who has access to the building uh, based on values the school might have? I don't know who to put this question to. I'm not a lawyer, but um, the lawyers that are here can weigh in. But I, I think the key term is unlawfully discriminate. There are, you can lawfully dis discriminate, um, and I think, um, so it's safety. Uh, if there's a safety concern, um, those types of things. So it, it doesn't completely tie you, no? no? So, okay, Bill better take The example you give, Brian, the town of Stowe went through last year. And while many residents in the town did not, uh, and I don't remember the exact group, and I'm actually glad I don't, uh, but it was a group that is questionable as to whether or how many people would be in support of or not in the town but wanted to use the high school at Stowe to hold a rally. And the district had to provide access to the building to use it because they do it to other groups. And so there wasn't one where a judgment could be made by the board or the district the administration. And you could, it, 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 it went through some legal review. I don't have all of it, I know of it. So I can't give you any more particulars than that and I couldn't get into a conversation about what about this, what about that for the law. I just know that Stowe went through something like that last year and they had to allow the use of the building. Yeah, and there was also public protests and other things involved there as well. Yes. A lot of free speech around that. Yeah. Right. And I think what to open the building up to groups and discrimination based on the uh, and I think Alan would be able to speak to that pretty well. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's the, the risk that you take to open your building up uh, to community members. Uh, and so, just, just be 
because when Republicans do that, and in public facility, so I think that, that the First Amendment would have a pretty powerful influence on what you could do in terms of saying no to it. Uh, at least any other group. Are there any, any other comments, questions, or discussion? All those in favor of approving the motion for first reading of these policies, please say aye. 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 Those abstentions? Thank you. 3.6. Uh, just a brief update on Twin Peel. Maybe I, I, I can do the background and you can say what the current status is. Sure. Yeah. So at the uh, at August meeting, the executive committee asked. Bill and myself to reach out to uh, the Twinfield uh, Supervisory Union about school, school district. district. Thank you very much. Yes, Twinfield School District about uh, just to have a conversation about if there's any interest in exploring or openness to uh, the possibility of um, really looking at opportunities for how we can collaborate, coordinate, um, improve opportunities for students. Um, and of course, there's a backdrop of is there um, some cause for discussing, you know, a, a developing a closer partnership with them? Um, so we reached out to their board chair and to the superintendent. Uh, had two meetings with them, attended one of their board meetings. Their board chair and superintendent attended our uh, executive committee meeting at the uh, very end of August, I believe. Um, so those conversations are on. Yes, uh, so we're, we're look, Washington Northeast sits in the place where their supervisory union will be dissolved as of the end of the school year. Uh, so they're looking for a place for their two school districts, Cabot and Twinfield. The executive committee authorized you and I to talk about the Twinfield School District with them. Uh, we are meeting this Friday for our first meeting and looking for other dates. Uh, Stephen Look, Scott Thompson, and Kari Bradley, and myself are working with Patrick. Patrick's last name, I'm sorry. Healy. Healy, thank you. And Mark Tucker, uh, they're looking for another board member, but as of yesterday, I still didn't have another board member to join the conversation. So we're meeting then, and uh, this first meeting is about exchanging data. A lot of what we've looked at through the 706B process, and uh, what they have and what are the possible opportunities. And they're meeting tonight with the very supervisory union because the state plan said that they could be placed either with the Washington Central or Barry Supervisory Union. The state board has rights to redraw supervisory unions outside of Act 46 as in statute and can redo that when need be. So I also just thought, you know, just uh, to emphasize that these conversations are extremely exploratory. Nobody's authorized to take any actions. It's just kind of, you know, trying to figure out what the school system is like and, you know, what are some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses and, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to have a conversation about, about what we're doing. Any questions or discussion about that? Review of the draft uh, default articles of agreement. Uh, and we'll ambitiously set 10 minutes for this. Uh, we'll take another comment after the. Uh, this is a comment. This is about the lack of copies of documents of this. Of the agenda? Of and the, the, uh, the packet? Uh -huh. um, I just would like to know if there's. Feedback into account, and we'll try to correct for that in our next meeting. If we 
can anybody uh, else able to give up copy for these folks? Yeah. Because I'll. I'll So you want my copy? No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anytime uh, you want. So review of the draft of articles of agreement. Um, I'm going to assume that folks have at least had a chance to skim, at least to read the summary, I hope, uh, at least one and a half pages, if not to sort of dig deeply into the full uh, document draft articles of agreement. Um, I, I really, my, my only sort of objective in approaching this part was to offer an opportunity for board members to comment or ask questions um, or request more information or uh, things like that. I, I really didn't have a presentation since we, um, we did we did include the summary uh, in the packet, which I think hits most of the salient highlights. Um, and then we had the informational meeting, of course, before this one. I know not, I know not everyone could attend. Um, but that said, are, are there comments or questions or uh, requests for more information on the default draft articles of the agreement? Yes. So, Matthew, is, is there going to be a group, uh, a committee working on this, or is it is going to happen in, in the whole? The executive committee, when it put this on the agenda, uh, basically noted that this is a, it's a really complicated document with a lot of moving parts and deadlines. And so yeah, the, the point was that the, uh, the upshot of our discussion would be that we would try to charter uh, and charge a committee to dig into that more deeply and come back to us in October with you know, more specific questions, recommendations, how to approach it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Matthew? Yeah. Uh, this is just for perspective's sake. When the U32 High School Union was formed about 50 years ago, the Articles of Agreement took up not even a single page. Um, now, as you can see, those of you who have copies, uh, they, the today's 50 years later articles represent a huge either advance or retreat, depending on your point of view, in organizational and administrative complexity. So um, I'm, I, I just am amused by things like that. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, other comments here? anything very well, but I had two questions. One was about the restructuring vis-a-vis -vis debt. It seemed like every school was going to be, in fact, it was sold to the new district for one dollar and all the property is associated with it. Is that right? Yeah. That's what the article was called for. I was really surprised that it wasn't more like a business merger where each um, each company is evaluated right. and given a specific value. And then kind of buy into the new company or, you know. So I was very surprised by that and I would like a little more information as to what that might mean for each school. Additionally, uh, so that's a uh, section, sorry, I'm not tired of this word. Then there was also Article 3, the attendance. I was not sure if the paragraph stating that you could request a different school was, are we, are we working towards school choice within the district? I did not think that was the plan previously, but after reading this, I wasn't sure. I, I mean, I would say that we have not discussed that or put it on the table as a, a item for consideration by our boards. It's just a, a clause that uh, the agency or the state board included in the default articles. Um, I don't, I don't know what their rationale for doing that, uh, but they do make it subject to approval by what would be the new Union District Board and the superintendent, I believe. Um, that, that's all that I really know. I, I think it was trying to say, I think it was a clause that was in that article, Matthew, that was trying to say, 
keep your grade configurations, the students you serve the same for two years, but we're not going to lock you into that if there's a good rationale for a student to move from one building to another. So I think they were trying to have a little bit of an out there, Allison, I don't know if I haven't asked about that, but that's the way I interpreted that. And can I ask her one question about what she asked for? Of course. Because I feel like I'm going to be the one responsible for the analysis. <laughs> can you explain more what she meant about an analysis of not having a one, I, I know how I might interpret it, but I'm not sure it's the same as what you were saying. So can you again restate the first part where you said you wanted some pieces about um, the transfer of assets? I mean that I would think of this as a business transaction and we have six businesses that are all going to become one. And so were this a more obvious business transaction, each of those businesses would be evaluated and the values would be taken into account. And so let's say one business is worth $100,000 and one is worth $10,000. Well, then the one that's worth $10,000 has to buy in, so to speak. So in some way, accounting for the, the difference in what they are selling for $1, that seems stark. Just wanted to be clear. That's what I assume, but and that can be done. Rick? Yeah, as a build on that too, I mean, the idea that the, the school is then returned back to the municipality at some point, for, and you know, for the for the for a dollar, when in fact the town has paid for that structure, and now a, a, a value has been used up, and that school has been used by the consolidated group for ten years. There is a dollar amount of value loss in that, and investment at that point that the town then has to make, and it you know, an aging structure that probably hasn't been made. If, if a decision was made to get rid of a school, they're not going to be investing in it, you know, for long term on the capital side. So there's an inequity there. I mean, in general, as you know, I mean, on, as a general comment on these, I am incredibly disappointed with our legislator, legislature, and I think I'm incredibly dis disappointed with the AOE in, you know, the lack of respect to the municipalities through this multi-year conversation and the hundreds of people just in our district that have been involved with the developing alternatives and kind of coming up with options that would kind of work for us. And basically we've gotten, they've listened with the intent of taking that information, doing something productive. It has been used into block those pieces. Essentially, we've ended up, we're ending up with a mess here, in my opinion, and it's a real step backward in our governance. So we, we have significant time set aside, well, as significant as we have, um, to talk about sort of what our approach to the statewide plan is going to be. I think a lot of issues like the one you just raised will come up in that conversation. Um, but to try to, to tie this off, I, I just, I, I think, again, the sense of the executive committee was this is quite complicated. We need a dedicated group, a smaller group of people who will go through this with a fine tooth comb, uh, make sure that we understand everything that's in it, uh, and you know, come up with a list of, that include the questions we've already asked tonight, but also come up with other questions potentially that we want to relay to um, the state board or the agency. Um, so, uh, does anyone want to propose a motion to establish a committee? Um, in the Article 14, it's on page 51, 20 of 23 of the Articles themselves, but page 51. Um, it, under the process for amending Article of Agreement, it has a statement that uh, after the State Board of Education issues the statewide plan, then districts subject to merger shall have 90 days to form a committee with members appointed in the same manner and number as required for a study committee under. 16 BSA Chapter 11, and which shall draft articles of agreement for the new district. During this period of time, the committee shall hold at least one public hearing to consider and take comments on the draft articles of agreement. And then sub two, if the committee's articles are not approved within the 90 day period, then the provisions in the state board's default articles of agreement included in the statewide plan 
shall apply to the new district. Um, what that says to me is that uh, there is an opportunity uh, for the um, members of the new district uh, to draft their own articles of agreement uh, and get them to the voters for an approval. Um, it has to occur within 90 days after the statewide plan comes out, though. Uh, and I would urge um, all the local boards to appoint a member uh, to what will essentially be another 706 the study group, but for the purpose of drafting articles of agreement. Um, yeah, I think this language is pretty clear uh, because it has uh, timelines that say uh, if this isn't done, then the default articles, which these are, I think these are default articles, draft, will draft, draft, draft yes. default articles, but default articles nonetheless uh, will go into effect. Um, so I think there's a uh, superb opportunity for if, if, if there is a forced merger uh, for the new entity to draft its own articles of agreement uh, and get them to the voters for approval. Could I just respond to that, Katie, before? I would Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just that notwithstanding, there are certain things in the default articles that are <coughs> pursuant to the law, state law, and can't be amended or can't be changed. So I think they would, there should have automatic articles, correct? Um, that, that would be my comment, actually. Right, because, because there's some I, I that, that say, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, my reading of this is that uh, we can form a committee, uh, we can draft articles of agreement, but they have to conform to the content that's laid out herein. So if there is language that's specified, and if there is a, um, a note that the, amend the article can't, cannot be amended, I think it would just default to whatever Robin's rules or whatever apply to uh, the board because I don't think the the law affords a vacuum, um, and I think you'd be able to, to replace them. Yeah. Alan, so I I've, I've read these articles, believe it or not, three times, and each time I see something different, which is really scary. But one of the things that has struck me more it. than anything else is that we are about to see a huge fundamental change, possibly, in the way our schools will be governed. And it's not six months away, a year away, it's not even four months away, it could be as close as two months away. We will start on a path towards becoming obsolete, all of us here as the boards we represent, 
if the board, state board, issues a order in November that says we have to merge. We will have, as we will have until July 1st of next year to have a new union district form according to the rules, some of which cannot be changed through articles of agreement. We will have to have a new board in place who will have developed the budget and who we as five towns will have voted on for the start of the school year, July 1st next year, 2019. I mean, this is one of the most rapid transitions I think I've ever seen state government ask anybody to, to, to do. And I, 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 I worry about all of it. I mean, it really feels like the Titanic and we look out the window and the porthole and there's an iceberg there. And we can't really order tomorrow's supper. We have to really think what we're gonna do next really quickly. And I'm really worried that we're not prepared for what's about to happen. I'm not suggesting we can be prepared, but I think we can start looking at some very specific issues that I know from my town's perspective, I really worry about. One of the things we've been talking about is the transfer of assets, property. And I, I don't know if you realize, but the transfer of assets includes all cash assets as well. Yep. So if you have a fund balance, if you have anything in, 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 in any sort of reserve fund, that's all going to be subsumed as of uh, June 30th or July 1st, 2019. For my, for my town, potentially, we would be getting just about half of our total municipal budget in terms of the value of the asset of our reserves if that's what happens. And that's, that's, that's a big chunk of money, and I don't think my town, and I'm guessing your towns, didn't go to spend that money on a new district. I think we voted to have the money spent in Worcester or Berlin or whatnot. And I'm not trying to be parochial about this. I'm just saying that as a voter who voted for a school budget back in March, we voted for very specific things and very specific places to spend it. And I'm, I'm really worried how people in my town are going to react to that if they have to have to essentially have $170,000 given over to this new consolidated district. And for other districts, if you look at your balance sheets, it's much more. Um, and I, I think we all agree that this comes to pass, there is consolidation, in the long run, we are gonna be pooling all these funds. But we're sort of stuck right now between the way we have been operating and how we're about to be forced to operate. And it's, it's not very pretty. The pace is just amazingly fast, and I think a lot of us are going to really be scratching our heads wondering where the train has gone, because it's, it's, it could be really moving down the tracks very quickly. So I just want to point out, thank, thanks Ellen, I just want to point out that our, our time is rapidly evaporating. Um, there are probably 25 different topics that we could spend Hour talking about. I'm, I mean, that's never really like, we, could, we could spend 25 hours talking about different aspects of, of uh, the drafting of our agreement in 46, um, but we can't really do that tonight. Um, I'm hopeful that there are some specific things we can do, specific questions that we can answer that seem urgent. Uh, and then if there is you know, a strong feeling that we need to have a lot a larger and more broad-ranging conversation about a wide variety of things. I really think that we're going to have to think about scheduling another meeting for this board. Um, because that seems to me that's the only way we can do it. We can't, we can't sort of piggyback hours-long discussions on our WCSU board business meetings. Um, so I really am hoping that we can kind of move on a couple of these things and get to a really critical question for this evening. Um, and I know it's hard for people, people are worried and concerned and interested and have a lot of things to say, um, but I, I'm hoping that we can kind of keep those off the table if we can. Um, and if we need to, we'll schedule another meeting, absolutely. Um, so Stephen? Um, I'd like to bring us back to the agenda and the discussion 
um, because of some of the questions that have been posed here. If we establish a subcommittee on the statewide plan, they can be doing that work offline, answering questions like, is there a way for the current clerk and the current um, chair to have someone else and several of the other questions. Uh, in my mind, I think it's crucial that we form a group to do that work. And I would really like to bring us back to that item first before we move on to other questions and discussions. So I'll make a motion that um, we establish a subcommittee to review the statewide plan. Did, did, did draft article the statewide plan has not been achieved yet. Oh, I'm sorry, draft articles of agreement. Uh, is there a second? to just reviewing them if they had a recommendation on how it might be worded. I, I think I think I'd speak for the SU Supervisor Union Board that we would entertain any specifics. Can I? Um, this is just a clarifying question. So on the action agenda, there's an item that says establish subcommittee on statewide plan. So I first I just want to say how much I appreciate all of the thinking and work that went Many of us are really leaning on those of you who have put in countless hours to help us be more prepared and understand this a little bit better. But I wonder if you all could, uh, especially maybe folks from the executive committee, could share your thinking about uh, what a subcommittee might do. Or two subcommittees. I'll, I'll do my best, and anybody from the executive committee can weigh in. Uh, I think it's a lot of what we're doing. We have done a little bit tonight, but the informational meeting and this meeting, which is just to point out, we're not sure we understand this. And there are some parts of the draft equal health uh, articles of agreement that don't really seem to agree with each other, align with each other. Um, to an earlier point, we're not really sure of the legal underpinnings of what they're, they're doing, if they're sort of interpreting those statutes or their authority uh, correctly. So I think it's first of all just reviewing, practically speaking, you know, what really are we looking at here? Um, every piece of it. And, you know, we can give feedback to the state board. So if there are questions we have, recommendations we want to make, we do that. If there are articles that we, we can anticipate, we, the time frames are very short. So can we get an early jump on anticipating? If we wanted to amend an article, if we wanted to try to make a change, um, you know, what would that be? What would that look like? So it's just my, anybody I mean, I agree. I, we're, we're on an incredibly short timeline here. When we've been shoved down into this funnel with these things, and we're talking about discussing articles, and I agree, Chris, we actually need to be preparing, but I think what we should actually be doing, there is nothing on this agenda that's more important than this issue. This group ceases to exist in a very few months, essentially, and we're being, I actually think we should be looking. We are the people that are driving. These are our communities. These are our tax dollars. These are our kids. And I think we should be looking at what we can do to fight back. I mean, this is the legislature and the AOE, AOE out of control of the state school board. And I'm sorry, Matt, don't cut me off on this. This is the essence of what people are here for, probably. We, we and we have, need- We have an item on the agenda for this. I get that. We're trying to get to it. Okay. So I'm just asking you that. Well, I think we, we need- We also have a motion on the table. I have one question about the motion. Uh, do we need to specify how the committee would be comprised? Yes. How many people and who? So you're looking for me? For I don't I'm know. I'm just asking the question. Um, my answer would be no, but best practices might suggest we do that. So I would. Yeah. Uh, 
not hearing a friendly amendment, but I heard one that said each board um, appoint a member to this committee, um, one person from each board open for discussion. I think that we should consider whichever, if each board decides who, since you just say proposed transition board members, if each board were to decide who the transition board members would be, I think we should consider having the transition board members also be the ones who evaluate these things ahead of time, because that review process would probably make it easier for the transition board members to do their job. I think it's a great suggestion. I think at the local board, they're going to appoint that's going to be at their discretion. I appreciate the, the recommendation. Um, and I would, I would suggest that um, the board, that we have a number that are voters, but then others who can, can participate. Because if we're looking at the transition board, which is already spelled out um, as the current chair and, and um, clerk as of July 1, uh, there may be others who are interested in participating and um, have the skill and knowledge to participate in drafting what are basically governance articles. Um, and my, my hope is that the group would be crafting articles of agreement uh, that would reflect uh, the variety of the towns and uh, would include in uh, those articles issues that are very important to particular towns, even though they may not be important to all of the towns. So that would be the hope of uh, you know, having a broad range of uh, individuals from the different towns, uh, just so all of those issues uh, and concerns are at least addressed somehow. So, uh, go ahead. Has there been an amendment? Um, I'm gonna work on that just now. Okay. So Lisa, can I ask you to read back the uh, amendment? Um, that Stephen moved to create a subcommittee to review the draft article. Uh, with uh, here's the friendly amendment um, with uh, one member to be appointed from each uh, district uh, school board or by each district school board. And Chris, I don't know, anyone can come to the meetings. Right. Of, so they, you know, but, so. They'd be open meetings. Yeah, of course. So anybody can yeah, come. Absolutely. I'll okay. second that. Okay, I think that oh, would be friendly. You accept it? Yeah. I second it. Okay. All right, so I'm interested to call the question. <laughs> yes. All right, let's do that. All those in favor of uh, approving the establishment of the subcommittee, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Abstentions? Uh, we had to, it, the executive committee intended to do the same, uh, in other words, to establish a subcommittee specifically to examine the issue of, of debt and indebtedness, uh, because that one really has been the thorn in our sides all the way along. Um, and it's, you know, it's particularly complicated. Um, there's been some work done on it, but I think we just want to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and we literally have exhausted every possible uh, avenue or option. That was why we put this on the agenda as well. Thanks. Thanks. Um, in the agenda packet, I'm afraid I made you read a number of pages that um, I think are overtaken by events, and in particular, by, pardon me, by Paul Giuliani's letter. I've essentially come to the conclusion that there is no solution to our debt problem under current law. And even with, um, with the effort that was made by the legislature in 2017 to kind of create uh, what I refer to as an emergency parachute earlier, by an ability to transfer assets and liabilities from school districts to towns as municipalities. Um, evidently, 
that doesn't fly because the towns were not given the complementary authorization to receive that property from school districts. So um, essentially, well, we're screwed, <laughs> if I may put it in the vernacular. Um, the treatment of this issue in the uh, state plan is, um, is not very helpful because um, essentially this situation sets up a new merge district for failure. Uh, the state's, the agency of education's approach uh, to the debt problem was basically um, debt problem, what debt problem? I don't see any debt problem. Um, it, this is an approach that actually works surprisingly well in government, except when you're, what, the thing that you're pretending doesn't exist happens to be arithmetic. Um, so it, it's, it's inescapable. It, it comes to, our, to a newly merged district as a kind of you know, original sin that would be very difficult to, um, to overcome. suggest that I'm the last word on, on the debt issue. Um, there are plenty of people who are a lot smarter than I am. But, and, and I think actually the agency of education are those people. I mean, um, they understood from the very beginning that there was no solution, which is why whenever throughout our, our years long attempts at working with the legislature to get a solution, the agency lobbied tenaciously against those, um, that legislation. Um, undoubtedly, uh, here I am, uh, my hypothesis is that because it does represent a defect in the, in the concept, that um, acknowledging the defect would uh, create Political problems for the um, for the marketing of the of the issue. Get the mileage here. <laughs> uh, does anyone want to speak in favor of or uh, establishing a committee on debt or concur with Scott or? So, Scott, I frequently disagree. Um, I support favoring the subcommittee on. I agree with everything Scott said. It's not encouraging. Um, the feedback we've got thus far um, is not encouraging. However, if there's movement forward and we merge, this, in my mind, is the one issue that has to be resolved differently, even though it's mandated. It has to be resolved differently than what's being required. And as, as you alluded to, Matthew, we have to make sure we exhaust every single possible um, approach, uh, even if that goes against legal advice that we proceed to, to force an issue. Um, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to do everything we can possibly do to come to a resolution that's as fair as possible. And I don't think the current um, article of agreement on debt is as fair as it could possibly be. So I have one more comment about that. The e emailer sent an email today, and she was saying that instead of asking a lawyer whether some alternative way of handling the debt issue is legal or not, instruct the attorney to come up with a way that will work. And if it involves enabling legislation, I'm sure the legislation will be admirable. I just want to make that. So I agree with Stephen that we 
even though Scott's done a lot of work, that we should have a committee so that they, it, it, that, that is not a distraction of the committee that is doing that is the articles of agreement to, that there's somebody working on that, that issue. Okay. Sorry, I can't see Allison. Clarify if, when we vote on this motion, will that be the end of the discussion about consolidation, or are we going to move on to the request for whether to join a? We're going to move on to that. Okay. Yes. Fine. Thanks. At, at long last. So, uh, by the way, you're looking at Matthew. I'll, I'll say what I, I think Rick said something very profound last week in the executive committee on this issue. And that's looking at the current asset values. It's a similar, similar place where Allison was going earlier. What are the current asset values of the different districts? It's the way some districts have been able to work their way through the debt and look at the current um, repair level of all uh, and capital structure of all the districts and looking at that piece. Um, and I think if there were a committee to do the debt, I think it would be more expanded to what are the assets and liabilities, just not the debt and to understand the current value of each uh, entity. So I would like to make a motion to form Please. a committee um, that can have the force of one, one member per board. Is there a second? A second. There are some seconds. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of establishing a subcommittee on uh, the debt issue, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Sentence? Thank you. Okay, 3.64, which is, let me just look at the time, which is beautiful. Um, <laughs> we have one local board meeting for 730. I don't know how we hear it's time up this question. It's worth it. Um, and I ask for your forgiveness and maybe some patience and means. Um, we need to have a discussion about this. We also need to leave time for a public comment on this issue. Um, so I will shoot for 7.45, because it's 33 minutes. Um, I'm going to set aside 24 minutes for more discussion. I'm going to ask people to speak for 90 seconds at a time. So we can get through about 15 people in that amount of time. Um, just to why are we? What is this question? Why did the executive committee want to bring it? Um, so I, I just want to start by saying that we're, we're united uh, in our principled opposition to a forced merger, uh, and we're unanimous in that opposition as well. Um, uh, but we may differ uh, on to what lengths uh, we are willing to go to contest. Merger. That seems like an important question. Um, it's one that was brought to the fore uh, this month by a request uh, to the Washington Central, as you know, Washington Central boards uh, to join an as yet unspecified legal action uh, to contest a forced merger. Um, so that's the question. Um, in general, it's to what lengths are we willing to go to contest this? Um, and the specific question is, you know, what is the SU uh, board's opinion Joining a legal action uh, to contest the force merger. So, I'm probably going to want to step out of my moderator role, shockingly, and have my 90 seconds. I'll just go six so that there's no, I'm not waiting to last. I'm just saying, please go ahead. Yes, Ray. You know, I think we should deal with this as a supervisory union and, and at least comment on it. It's, uh, you know, we have unanimously, you know, made a decision 
And I know that we're in different places, and there are different people that have different feelings, and that's okay. You know, what's really, at, what is really being, the challenge here is, is who is making the decisions? I mean, we are the, the governance is about us. These schools are about us. These are our kids. These are our tax dollars, and they impact our communities. And yet, we are, you know, in the act of not, is we, in the act of kind of d delivering into the hands of the bureaucracy, the decision making, we, we, we're losing our power here. We need to oppose this. And I think we use every tool at our fingertips to do this. And this is a, this is a viable option. It won't cost us a lot of money. And you know, there are real questions of, of legality involved with many pieces of this legislation. And by God, I think this is an opportunity for us to fight back. I think it's an obligation for us to do that. It's good. It's just the contrary. In fact, this whole lawsuit is completely consonant with the instructions that the supervisory union board has given Flora, Matthew, and me to defend our, our alternative governance proposal. <clears throat> what we're doing with this is defending the rule of law. It's not about whether merger is a good idea or not. It's about whether we all observe the law in its integrity and not in some dismembered version where major sections are locked off at the arbitrary caprice of the agency of education. And I think it's especially important for people who believe in merger to support the lawsuit because if we can get merged at gunpoint, it will be a failure. Since my name was brought up, <laughs> obviously I have a different viewpoint about a lawsuit. So I'm going to say my piece about the lawsuit first. The way that I look at this, this is our taxpayer dollars fighting our taxpayer dollars in the court of law. I think it's absurd. I think it's a colossal waste of time and energy that should be otherwise spent. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to be like a divorce where the two parents waste all of the assets of the entire marital property. And nothing but trauma is left at the end. And that would be a correction. So I'm going to turn to a completely different topic because every argument that I have heard against this murder comes from a place of fear and mistrust. That Definitely. really bothers me. We all send our kids together in the same school in seventh grade. There is no distrust amongst the communities of WCS. We all trust each other. We all are great communities. We're all doing the right things by our kids. There's not going to be a cash grab. East Montpelier isn't going to take your capital fund and go spend it on playground equipment. You know, but, so I would encourage all of us to take a breath and step away from the overheated rhetoric that we're all hearing on all sides and understand that at the end of the day, everybody in all of the towns want the same thing. And this will work out okay. Does 
I really think we need to join the lawsuit. The five towns worked very hard to work together as best as we could. And at the end, some people, some of the towns didn't really want to join to do the alternative governance structure, but they realized it was best for our communities to not be divided and to come together. We need to take this last step. There are several things um, we decided we'd work together, and we need to take this last step together. It's not going to cost us anywhere near the kind of time we're talking about um, having a, a, a committee to work on the Articles of, con of Agreement. It's not going to take us any, any huge amount of money the thing that worries me most about if the town, if the state, it's not the one thing, it's a thing that worries me right now. If the state on November 30th says that our communities must be merged, the world will know that the Callis and Worcester tax rates are going up unbelievably. How many houses in those towns will be sold. How many people will want to move to our two towns, even, even with the schools still open? With, with the tax rates that high, people are not going to want to come here. We, I'm out of time, we need to join the lawsuit. We can leave it at any time. I also think we can join the lawsuit at any time. Uh, so there's no reason, reason to act precipitously to do so. Uh, reasons I oppose it, I think, is unlikely yeah, yeah, yeah. to succeed, although that's a minor reason to really. uh, Another reason is that it's a blank check, uh, not just in terms of funds, but also in terms of approach. Uh, nobody here has seen exactly what the legal action is going to be that we're being asked to join. We're, we're being asked to join at sight unseen, uh, just trusting it folks that are putting it together. Um, that, not, that is not the way that these boards, that our boards don't typically operate. Um, but I oppose it most of all because I don't think it's good for kids. Um, and I think that that's my first priority always. Uh, if we seek an injunction, uh, we have a superintendent, principals, teachers, uh, their licensure with the state depends on their obeying the law. Uh, if we are going to be asking them to take different approaches, if our boards are divided, and sort of asking them to do one thing or another, uh, we put their, to their careers uh, potentially in jeopardy. We, at the retreat, we talked about coordination, joint scheduling, sharing of resources. Are there going to be boards that aren't going to participate in a process like that? Uh, our public communications might be divided. The state priorities would be divided. Um, would we close a school to privatize it, divorcing it entirely from public education? I don't think any of these are good for kids. Not good for the school system. Uh, 
Um, in terms of joining the lawsuit, I think Floor makes a fair point about when, um, that the state hasn't issued a plan yet, um, but we shouldn't be deciding at that point whether to or not. I think we should be prepared to um, right now um, and throw our hat in the ring. Uh, Matthew makes some fair points about uh, going along to get along, um, but what we haven't seen in this whole process is that type of equity from the state board. Um, in terms of all of the um, alternative governance structures that were presented to the state board, uh, to the state um, Department of Education, how many were approved or recommended? Very few, if any. Uh, we presented uh, significant information as to how we are moving forward jointly in many areas that we can. Uh, and that was just, you know, it was really not really considered, I think. There's an equity issue there as to who is making the decision uh, that would be worthy of a legal challenge. Uh, we also heard today about the extraordinary differences in debt uh, that would be shifted from one community to the other. Uh, and you may say it's all one district after a merger. It's true, but it's not all one taxpayer, uh, and it's not all one tax rate. And so um, at this point, I would think we would want to prepare to join when the time is right. Uh, but it's, it's, there are times when we have to stand up, and I think this is one of them. Is it Adrian or Susan? I am also very uncomfortable with joining this lawsuit at this time. I think we don't know what's going to happen with the state board. We don't know what the lawsuit's about. We actually don't have any idea how much it's going to cost us. Our budgets are really tight. I have real trouble with spending money that could go to students and teachers and education for a lawsuit that I don't really know anything about. I also feel really strongly that these are all our children and we have all their best interests at heart. And I don't think communities are gonna pit one community against the other. I have great faith in this Washington Central community that we care about all our kids. I also have a statement to read from Carl Bradley who was unable to be here tonight. So I might need another 97. He says, I feel strongly that we should comply with the state board's decision if it is to force a merger. Act 46 is the law of the land, and we may not have persuaded them that a merger is impractical. I personally was not persuaded myself. I think it's even more important that all the boards act in the same way, whatever that is. I learned through this process that our unity, whether it's one board or multiple boards, is critical to our doing the best job we can in helping our kids learn. Um, I think everyone here is um, operating from the heart. Um, I would like to address the contention that uh, merging is best for kids. I think when you look at the situation that we know of in West Virginia, in Maine, in New York, um, and frankly in Harwood, uh, you can see that there are real issues that some of the kids, you know, the kids who live in the larger, richer towns, to find maybe they get some AP classes. But the kids who live in the poorer towns who have a longer, um, they end up getting bused, um, they, their families end up getting disconnected, um, and they themselves are not necessarily being served. And so I think um, to make any contention about what's best for kids has to take into consideration the, way, the different roles of the town. Sorry, I clapped. Stephen. So I don't think it's a surprise to anybody I favored merger all along, so I oppose joining the lawsuit. And then I'll just offer a point of clarity of the districts that offered alternative plans. 34 out of 37 alternative plans were approved. The vast majority were approved. If you're in the minority, it was not approved. So we're, we're one of you said 34 out of 37, 34 out of 47. I 
No, that, that's no. no, that's bogus numbers. Sorry. Speak up. So, so yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my previous job trying to decide the very question that we're all being asked here tonight. And one of the things you have to realize when you bring a lawsuit is that losing can actually make things worse. You don't just lose, you can make more things worse. And you do that if the decision against you creates case law that gives the state even more power than it appears to have now in determining what it can do in uh, school governance. It's a really hard thing to accept because your heart is saying one thing, but your mind really has to tell you that there is a risk when you file a lawsuit. And if you don't feel at least 50, if not 60 or 70% sure that you can win it, you really should have second thoughts about it because you can th make things worse if you lose it. For example, if we brought a suit like this and we lost it, it could be the state would be emboldened through a court decision by the, by the Vermont Supreme Court to intrude even more into activities in our schools. It could give them more power than they actually do have now. It might not happen, but you don't know that. But I, I have to tell you, personal experience, one of the worst things is losing a lawsuit and seeing a decision cited later to work against you. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I think uh, it's, it's premature at this point to make a decision like this. I, don't think, I also think it's premature to know, to have any sense of what, what the real cost is or risk is or advisability of the lawsuit because we don't know what the state board is going to do. In fact, if you listen to some of the conversations that the state board doesn't really seem to even have the framework yet about how to make this decision, but on October 2nd or 3rd, whatever, whatever their next meeting is, they're going to start doing that and probably not start getting a better sense. But you know, if, if the state board is persuaded by geographic isolation, but not that, or the other way around, that's going to, that's going to drive which, which communities are push this and not, and if it is, if, if some AGS proposals are, are approved but ours is not, there's going to be a smaller population of those who, would, who might, might consider suit after that, and we might be more or less on our own, and I think we would at that point need to look at the Board of Education's decision and um, discuss with the legal counsel at that at that point, I, I don't think we can simply join uh, other towns because depending on what the Board of Education says, um, it, our interests may not be aligned with with other towns depending on the, the board's decision. I, I the only I think the only way I'm incorrect on that is if the board just blanket approves or denies all of the AGS proposals in that issue right now. But I'm not. I'm not sure that that's certain. Okay. Uh, John. I hate to weigh in on momentous issues when I don't feel really confident about the risks and benefits of the two courses of action. And that is where I find myself tonight. And I have done what I, you know, I've done everything that I could to get a better understanding of all of that. But um, so I just wanted to, to state that. And I think that many of us are in that position. And it's not a good position to be in when the, when the stakes are so high. Um, but I will say that I do not support joining the lawsuit at this, at this point. And I would um, echo comments that have been made by uh, many of you who stated that position. Are there any other board members to come? Um, two and a half years ago when this whole shebang started, uh, I had a conversation with Scott I, I, 
at that point, thought it looked pretty clear that the state wasn't going to accept anything we did. I'm very proud of this for the work that we've put into this. The, the amount of work and effort we've put into making this work for us has been phenomenal. And it's been great to be a part of and great to watch. But my argument to Scott that day, two and a half years ago, was if the topic of you know how, how do we go about fighting and, and my thinking at that time, and still my thinking today, is if, if, if citizens of our towns want to sue the state or fight this legally somehow, that's terrific. It's reprehensible. I'm all in favor of that. But we as school board members are here to run a school. We're not here to use our resources to fight that legal battle. I don't feel comfortable backing a legal challenge at this point. I want us to take our energies and put our energy our resources and building the best school system we can for our kids. So I think we're pretty much trying to hundred and twenty four minutes, right? So um, I'm gonna invite the, the um, folks that are here to, to speak before I do I just want to note for everyone's sake that uh, the executive committee's thinking on this was that we would actually do a straw poll at the end of this because the SU board itself hasn't been invited to join the legal action, and, and I think can't do so. Um, so, but we were interested in sort of getting an expression of the group about whether um, the majority favors the SU getting involved in it or not, as well as whether the majority favors uh, investing time, resources, and effort uh, in supporting it or not. Um, so we set the strong poll because that would allow everyone that's here uh, to express their opinion um, rather than just the voting members. So with that said, if there are any members of the public who want to show, please come up to the, uh, the front, um, and we'll get you a mic. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to, to speak for one minute at a time. Um, that's kind of over very short. I apologize for that. Oh, thank you. My name is Charles Mary. I'm in the uh, incredibly in the of the uh, Yeah, I, you know, it's a great discussion. What I, would do, what I would recommend you do at this point is take the fight to the school board. Right on the state board. My understanding, I just reread uh, before coming here, the seven page detritus from the acting secretary of state responding to your thoughtful proposal. And my understanding is you're given an opportunity to write a one page response. That's not a good process. So, what I recommend you do is that I say, recommend you send a strong letter, respectful but strong and forceful letter on the state board saying, articulating the falsities contained in this report and demanding that they, consistent with the statute as passed, that the alternative governmental structure and folks that put together be passed. Put it to them. And with respect to the lawsuit, I kind of think Florida's point is well taken, but I would put a letter of intent uh, saying that following the decision of the, uh, the board, we, may, we very well may join this uh, lawsuit. And by the way, the law of the land is the Constitution of 46, and this is a violation of the Equal Protection of the Proportional Contribution Clause, so it's incumbent on us as citizens to fight it. And he's an attorney. <laughs> this person today, by the way. Uh, John Raven, not an attorney, but I just wanted to bring up two points. Floor brought up uh, an email from Edie Miller, and she said, you need to task your attorney uh, to seek outcomes that you're, you're looking to achieve. Um, Mr. Giuliani clearly wasn't tasked with seeking a, a methodology or finding holes in the AOE's argument to, to favor uh, a win if there were a lawsuit. If you contrast what Mr. Giuliani provided with what Mr. Kelly provided, another attorney, two very different perspectives. Same law, Mr. Kelly, David Kelly, uh, an attorney, found huge holes in the AOE's position. That's number one. The other thing is, if folks here think that the AOE's uh, decision was not political, I've actually met with the governor's office already, but it's very political. This is the governor's office agenda that's being yeah. carried out, and by joining a lawsuit, we fight politics. Hiding does not help you. This is a political battle, and you gotta fight fire with fire, folks. Gail Graham Callis, and uh, I don't uh, mean to be naive about my comments or question, but I was at 
the hearing at the State House recently, as were many of the rest of you. And I, my question is, I listened to all of the testimony, almost all of it, and I did not hear much positive attitude about consolidation or merging. So was spending that day at the State House a waste of time? Were they listening? How can an agreement we uh, ask for your name and where you live? First, my name is Scott Bassett, I live in Kansas. How can an agreement that's good for half the group, maybe a little more than half the group, but terrible for the rest of the group, be good? It's not logical, it's not fair. As Attorney Kelly said, shotgun weddings almost always generate enmity, particularly where the parties are moving in laudable but different directions. Once mergers are compelled, the genie of unfair debt distribution and the power of larger communities to exert their will over smaller communities cannot be put back in the bottle. I urge you to take the responsible path and fight like hell against this forced merger. programs are getting cut because everyone's upset about your debt being shared and put on everyone else. And in Middlesex, when for two years now, the citizens have been clamoring for more input into what happens in our school and suddenly we go the exact opposite direction and have less. Citizens like me are gonna have one question for all of you. Did you do everything in your power to stop this? Thanks.
all the KAE smell failure. <coughs> folks who put in a lot of time working on this over the years. I commend you for that. But I've got to say I'm pretty disappointed. I've got to say I'm a little disappointed. We've spent a lot of time talking about these things when what you should have been doing is been out talking to the public. And I don't mean just invite people to the meeting, but really get out there and do something. <clears throat> You've all been to town meeting, or at least I hope you have, and you know that when you get out and there aren't issues that people get wound up about, you don't have very many people at town meeting. Well, sometimes you have to go out and explain what you're really talking about. So <clears throat> if you've done that, a lot of the things that you've done in the last two years would be moved. Anyway, we're now down we're, to the place. We're, we're, we're at time. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, oh, sir, right now, sir we're, everyone's oh, under the I'll same time. I'll tell you what. Sir, everyone's under the same time. Right? Yeah, so for the purposes of the order, I'm going to ask. Thank you. Thank you. I'll write my check right now for the fund to promote this suit against the state. Thank you. So for the uh, for the board, we have a gentleman, Mr. Page, I believe, who is not a, as one member, uh, who is not a resident of our town. Uh, so we're required to hear, uh, provide opportunity for people from our towns to, to speak, but not necessarily those who don't live in our town. So I just wanted to note that. Uh, no one objects. Mr. Page. Thank you. So Very good. My name is Brooke Page, and I'm from Washington, Vermont. Uh, we were forced to merge with the town of Orange next door to us. It's very beneficial to Orange and very various to Washington. Um, there's some confusion here about what Act 46 is all about. Act 46 is confusing because it's designed to fail. It's designed to be the next step that began long ago with uh, Phil Hoff in 1964, creating one statewide school board and one statewide school tax. Uh, Phil Hoff failed. Madeline Quinn took up the charge along with uh, her Secretary of Administration, John Dooley, who eventually issued the Brigham decision. It failed. Uh, and so it's gone. Uh, Howard Dean made the same attempt and it failed. So Act 46 has boldly been brought forth by the legislature with, in coordination with the uh, Agency of Education. So we're in time, sir. You can wrap up in 15 seconds. I can. Uh, the, the bottom line is that the legislature passed at the urging of the AOA Act 46. Act 46 violates Section 68 of the Vermont Constitution as amended in 1960. It's just as clear as that. Hi, Paul Parton. I'm Paul Parton from Berlin, and I want to, as I look at this table up there, I see a lot of people I work with on the board, and I see amazing minds, amazing people, people that care about the kids in our community. And uh, I think about a forced merger, and I think, which half of those people do I not want to be directly related and have direct input into making our schools better for our kids? Because with a forced merger, at least half of this group at that front table will no longer be directly involved in the governance and decision making. So I would also encourage you to let the AOE know immediately that if a forced merge happens, that we will fight it in any way we can. If a forced merge, I believe a government should lead, and I'm a patriot for a government that believes in individual rights and freedom and local input, I support that. But a government that imposes or forces you to do something is not one I support. And I think a forced merger is a dangerous precedent to set in our form of government. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
in the interest of expediency, because this is not a binding motion, I'm going to go ahead and try to phrase a straw poll question. I would invite help. Uh, so if I get this wrong, please don't hesitate. I don't know you won't hesitate to let me know. Um, so the question I guess I would like to ask, um, and again, this is non-binding. So the question is, uh, does the WCSU board uh, support joining the legal action proposed by the Vermont Association of, so the Alliance for Vermont School Boards, I'm sorry, I always get that wrong with numbers, school board, uh, um, today. So I'm going to say, I think it's too narrow. Okay. I think, Richard, I think that motion's too narrow uh, because if you're heard, and, and it can give a not an accurate response, uh, flavor or, or, or sense of the board. Because uh, there, are, there are a number of people who said not yet, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of uh, waited, you know, waited for the state board to uh, make a decision. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to be broader. Um, three options: maybe yes, no, um, or wait. Uh, wait until the state board uh, makes a decision before making a before committing. Well, I added the word today. I know for that reason. Yeah, it's because right. I because I think people might. Maybe they would look at the layout for the state board and answer at the next but, meeting. But, it, but you know this is going to be reported in the papers. Uh, and the sense if you say today, people are saying, no, we're not, I'm not comfortable doing it today. We're giving this impression, I think, of the true sentiment of the board. So I think you need at least three options uh, to give a true sentiment of the board. Because you've heard quite a number of saying, not, not yet. I'd be more comfortable asking two separate questions. What I worry about is we're giving three options is that you get kind of a muddled response potentially. You can get plurality, great, is what you may get. Uh, but that is democracy as well, because plurality sometimes you know, comes to prevailing opinion. Um, but I think if you give, if it's two, one or the other, um, it doesn't take into account the nuance of the discussion that we had tonight. Would well, a second question be, would uh, the aspect this would be acceptable to you? Would the SE board um, be open to the idea of joining a legal action to contest a forced murder in the future? Is that the best that's, that's, that's a better frame, I would say. Well, I, I, because I know you, folks who are saying no now, I'm saying both questions. Well, see, I think that would be actually a good question because that takes into account those who would join now um, and those who would um, wait to the future, and it also takes into account folks who are now saying. I think my Chris here. So, I don't know if I need that. I can talk really fast. Uh, I think a possible, so I'm Chris Cataract. He's the first one to ever speak at any of these things, so bear with me. Uh, I think a possible question that could combine both of those might be would the school board be willing to now or in the future join to a lawsuit? And then you get a clear idea of people that may be interested in joining. And then a clear idea of people that are interested in not joining. I'm fine with the question. I think that my my concern about it is that the local, local boards will be, or district boards, I should say, uh, will be deciding this evening about whether or not to join the lawsuit. Um, because the deadline for doing so is on September 28th. It's two days. Um, so I, I, I think there's some benefit in my mind to uh, board members knowing what the sentiment of um, this board is with regard to joining that legal action today. Uh, but, yeah. No? I, I, don't think, I think it's a good question. Okay. I agree with Matthew. I, I would like two separate questions, if, if possible. So one today. And then the other one in the future, because before I, at least on my, make up my mind, I need more information from the lawyers. I actually want David and Margaret here to explain more what is it involved, if we have to cross that bridge later. So if we could do the two separate, I would feel more comfortable, and I think we would get a better sense of everybody that's my take. I'm going to ask the question. Okay, Alan, after Alan speaks. Matthew, might, might you accept an amended 
uh, motion that asks, do you as a member of the WCSU board at this time reject participation in a possible lawsuit against the state concerning consolidation? Could you repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. Okay. The question to us would be, do you as, as a, a member of this board or their local boards, do you at this time reject participation in a possible lawsuit against the state regarding consolidation? I don't typically like framing questions in the negative. I was trying to get two questions down to one. So I think true. Chris's question. That's how I came I up like with the next one. Better. I'm just going to go ahead and ask my question. <laughs> so you can ask other ones if they want. It is just a straw poll. It's not a, again, not a binding decision. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Since, and, and I, I think I'm representing the intent of the executive committee, since it's only a straw vote, we want all um, members here voting, not just the Four voting five. members that's correct. to the yep. issue board. Yep, that's right. It's only straw, so it's non-binding. So we wanted to hear all the voices, not just three designated. My question is, is the uh, WCSU board in favor of joining the legal action uh, of the, uh, that's been proposed by the uh, Alliance for Vermont School Boards today? Uh, if, you're, if your answer is yes to that question, um, please raise your hand. Can you repeat the question? Uh, is the SU board in favor of joining the legal action uh, that's been proposed uh, by the uh, Alliance for the Law School Board today. So if your answer is yes, please raise your hand. So is the second question coming? I'm sorry. Do, do we get the middle option? Or one second, second. Let's finish with this one. Then wait, we'll wait. Wait. I don't get the, she needs to know if she's getting the middle I option. Answer. I'm anticipating two questions, okay. at least, in the moral point of So all those who do not approve, please raise your hands. Can you restate the... Can, can you yes, they got the confused. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is the SU board uh, in favor of joining the legal action uh, that's been proposed uh, by the Alliance for Vermont School Boards today. Are you if you're not in favor, I'm asking you to raise no. your hand. No. Okay, so I... You didn't get the middle ground, though. This, you said yet. today. Okay. Not yet. We'll get there. She's got the no votes twice. I counted 10 in favor and 15 not. We had 12. I had 12. 12 and 15? Okay. Sorry. Sorry. All right. So what is the answer? The answer is that the SE board is not in favor. 12 to 12 in favor, 15 not in favor. Did you think they were the abstain? Are there any abstentions? Well, but, but Ka Carrie's not here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, Allison, I didn't quit. Are you standing or? No, she's waiting for that next question. I'm so sorry. I do not understand. I, I thought there was going to be three options, so I did not vote yes for today, thinking I could vote yes for the future, but there was no yes for the future, so I would add my vote to yes for today if forced to do so. So if we want to open the count somehow, Sorry that I don't understand basic questions, but that one was not clear to me. Okay. So 13. So 13. 13. Is that right? It's just like it was. All right. So I think, just from my perspective, yeah. I'm, the understanding for that question was, do you support joining right now? And then he'll ask another question saying, would you be in support of it in the future? 
Right. Is that that's what the goal? Right. So I think so right. be, are you do you want to join now or do you want and say, no, I'm not ready to join now? Yes or no? And then he'll ask the question, but maybe in the future we could join. So we have another question. And Chris, could you repeat your question for me? So that I... Sure. So the question that I posed was, would the board be interested in joining in a lawsuit in the future, depending on the decision from the state board? But if you already voted no, this is a separate question. Separate 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 depending on the decision we get from the powers that be. From the state board, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yes. All right, so all those in favor of that. Uh, That's everybody, right? All please of raise your hand. I want to just make a comment that this is a point in time today. And the reason that I voted no is that I don't have information at this time that would drive me to join a lawsuit. That doesn't mean that I couldn't get new information later. And I know some of you are disappointed, and I respect that. But at the same time, that is part of my job as an elected board member. And I take it very seriously. One last uh, question, not related to the topic, uh, but rather to future board meetings. Uh, we have a carousel meeting scheduled in late October 24. Thank you. Uh, we have committees, two committees, meeting between now and then to take further looks at these issues and delve into the report back to us. Um, but I do want to ask if people feel like more meetings are necessary to have conversations on this or not. Mm -hmm. We're not on this question. We're sitting on the larger issue of what's happening in the timeline and different things need to be done. I'm not hearing a huge outcry of a claim for the idea of the meeting. Um, so I'll take that as a general joke. Is there any other business that board member I want to bring uh, tonight? Yeah. 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 Yeah.